Hello everyone, it's Pojo, and welcome to another Eternal Patch Breakdown. Uh, we got a couple new cards being changed up today as of the April 7th patch. Uh, there's a balance patch going into play, primarily focused on throne cards, with a couple of expedition choices as well. Well, uh, primarily we're seeing nerfs to Ikaria and Maple Oft Huntress, as well as buffs to Power Cell, Borderlands Lookout, Rolling Spike Pack, Forge Mark Scrivener. Uh, so it's going to be a pretty short one to talk about, fortunately, but also there's some pretty interesting things to be talking about here in terms of overall changes to the meta and what kind of stuff is happening in both Throne, Expedition, and, uh, you know, the draft environment, anything like that. Um, so let's go ahead and get into it. Let's talk about these cards. First things first, Ikaria First Reaper going up to 7. 5 cost 7 for with uh, the ability to kill stuff. Uh, the reason given for this is primarily that Akaria is proving to be too dominant against certain creature types, specifically creatures without Aegis or summon effects that provide extra value. Um, overall, I am a fan of this change. I think that because this does def it does hurt a card that uh, certainly was like a very strong choice for mono shadow decks and a strong reason to go into mono shadow, kind of like a defining card in the archetype, similar to Akaria, uh, the, <laughs> the, the original Akaria, I believe, the Akaria the Liberator. Um, so Akaria First Reaper, Going up to 7 does put them in the same line as Akaria first uh, Akaria the Liberator, which is pretty cool. Uh, I think that like the two both being 7 gives them like kind of a nice little mirror synergy, which when you're coming into the game from other sort of setups just sort of, you know, ties it in really nicely, which is just something I enjoy. Uh, it does mean that like it's going to be a little bit easier to play other types of units in Throne. I do think that that is actually like a reasonable change. Uh, Ikaria is maybe not like the most powerful card in Throne or anything like that, but Throne has a lot of interesting high value cards and taking one up or down by and large should just make the meta a bit more interesting. I'm not, I'm not particularly concerned about this change. I think it looks nice. I think it plays nice. And I think that seven is still a perfectly reasonable price to pay for a 5-5 that kills a unit and also has flying and it also deals with sights and it also destroys spells and yeah it's just got a lot of good text on it for a 7 cost and so it's still got good tempo, it's still got good value, it's still got good interaction, it's still a solid toolkit card and it does have a very very expensive shadow influence cost but it is all of those things for shadow decks specifically and it still fulfills all of those goals. So. Seems fine to me, lowering the power level, not going to be too much of a change. The next one up is Mabeloft Huntress. This is the second nerf. Uh, Mabeloft Huntress was a 2-1 for 2. It's going up to a 3-1 for 3. So as we can see, that's, uh, yeah, it's going to be a pretty significant change in the way that Mabeloft Huntress is played and is used. There's a couple of different things that change up as a result of this. The first is that Mabeloft Huntress can be played solo a lot more often. Uh, you can play it uh, on three and it can kill stuff that are like three threes or three four threes, which are more common unit types. It basically just uh, interacts with a larger portion of unit types. Uh, the reason given for this nerf is to slow down how early players can make a huge killer unit out of her and allow the opponent more time to set up basically making it so that imbuing is less likely for the big old Mavaloft Huntress, and also so that you can do some other interesting like things with the card. Uh, a notable impact of this, aside from the card actually slowing down, which I think is well worth the um, uh, a significant nerf even if the card's strength is going up, uh, the notable things about this are that you can no longer plunder on two with Mavaloft Huntress, which I think this is a pretty important distinction. Uh, many decks want to run two cost plunder cards because the primary th way the system works you can either get two three or four power off of mulligans so if you have the ability to guarantee a third power on two that tends to add a lot of strength and consistency to your decks Mavaloft Huntress was providing this for pretty much all primal decks because it's one of the primary forms of removal for the deck and it also gives you the plunder effect so that if you ever get power stuck if anything ever like affects your play style that like might make it a little bit difficult to get over that hump uh, uh, Huntress can fix for you. At three, uh, three cost plunders are a little bit different. They don't fix your power in the same way that you might consider other cards power sources. Uh, I will generally consider any card that costs two or less to be a power source in terms of determining how many power sources are in your deck because 
that will determine your overall curve even if you're spending two on the card on two that means you're still getting to your curve on three and four and five so that kind of thing just like kind of allows you to play the cards as power so with Maveloft going up to three I think this does mean that Maveloft decks lose a lot of power in that they have to actually include more power in their decks um, and that's going to change up their curve a little bit in addition to slowing Maveloft Huntress down which is something that isn't mentioned in the patch notes but seems really worthy of remarking on seeing as the card is now only fixing for you if you have two power and or if you have three power and you can actually get the card down on that front uh, obviously making big imbue units is still perfectly possible with the card it doesn't have overwhelm or anything like that and the units will be a little bit bigger so they're the overall power of the card as a removal tool has not been changed too much but i think that this cost nerf is a pretty significant one in the meta and may reduce the use of maple of tundras in the future as well as reduce the use of blue decks in the future just because it was such a dominant tool in the meta. I don't think that people will stop using this card necessarily. It's still blue interaction, it still interacts really well with other cards, and it can be used to interact solo with other cards, which is an unexpected side benefit. But the fact that it no longer fixes your power, it means it's no longer just an auto-include in primal decks. Uh, there may be some consideration for whether or not the card needs to belong in those types of lists. Uh, that's a pretty good change overall. I think that Mavelot Huntress was definitely bordering on oppressive in Expedition in particular, and it's popular in both Throne and Expedition, so seems fine to see the little nerf, especially since we're getting some other more interesting uh, buffs. All right, next up is Power Cell, and we're getting into the buffs now. Power Cell was a 2-1, is a 2-2, two, two, so it's getting a nice little extra health bonus. Uh, the buffs, there's no, been no reason given beyond just aiming at uh, helping to give aggressive decks more options in the Throne metagame. However, this is also a change that improves Expedition Sentinels. Uh, we have some Expedition Sentinel decks that use Power Cell already, and the card does do quite a bit. It's got that lovely decay ability. It does die to too many things already, but uh, like now it's no longer dying to Varus Favor, to uh, any sort of like small damage effect like uh, Ruin Ruinous Blast. I think it's Ruinous Blast. Oh, one damage to two different targets, or any of the cards that just do one damage no longer kill Power Cell. But this card is also a Sentinel that gains more strength as more Sentinels roll out, which means that it's got potentially a little bit more power as time goes on. So yeah, I think that's uh, that's pretty reasonable. Um, like uh, Sentinels were not like the most popular archetype. They're certainly a good archetype, and this actually could roll Sentinels into a place where they could be uh, really powerful and potentially very dominant, especially with Primal getting uh, nerfed back a little bit. We will see if that's a uh, a change in expedition in throne this is obviously a fine change like power cell was probably not seeing a lot of play in throne um the power burst is certainly nice for tempo and it does give aggressive sentinel decks a certain uh series of options to play around with so kind of a fun one uh i think that this one really is probably the most interesting change to me in terms of expedition stuff primarily because i play a lot with sentinels and i really like these types of cards and yeah i think it's uh definitely on the high side it puts sentinels a little bit more in line with mandrakes in terms of like overall average stat lines where they actually have like a decent amount of healthy picks and also like generally are pretty like cost efficient so they're more likely to be played you'll be able to play them a little bit more as a result of cards like these getting small buffs all right uh, the next one on our list is Borderlands Lookout. Uh, Borderlands Lookout, uh, plus one for each type of influence the enemy player has, is now a 0-3. I don't believe this card is legal in Expedition, but it is legal in Throne, and oh boy, uh, this thing used to kind of rule the draft landscape and also a significant part of the Expedition landscape. Uh, it was just a really, really powerful card. Uh, getting a 5-2 for one or a 4-2 for one uh, could be really, really solid, and even a 3-2 for one is a pretty ridiculous setup if you're actually playing against decks that have a lot of different colors. Uh, it actively punishes players for playing multiple colors, and it does it in a way that basically just uh, hastens aggression and allows you to do some pretty interesting stuff there. Uh, I think with five color decks being kind of a thing, this is an interesting counter tool to have. I'm also kind of surprised to see that this tool is getting an extra point of health just because of how oppressive it was against those types of decks. This is a really weird one for me because it's more of a it's more of an answer to decks that don't really exist yet as opposed to like a like very uh, serious aggro tool for everyone i mean a 2-2 two, two for one is still pretty good and a 2-3 th for one is uh extremely impressive as far as like general stat lines go i don't think either of them like necessarily break the bank but most of the time this is going to be a 2-3 for one and that's uh, one of the better stat one drops that you can get at the moment so 
Uh, certainly seems pretty interesting. Perhaps elves will see a lot of use with this. Uh, perhaps elf aggro is the idea to promote here. I'm just kind of curious as to why it's this card and not other aggressive elf cards or things along those lines. This one, this one doesn't make as much sense to me, but it's mostly going to be in Throne, and I don't think it's going to be the most oppressive card in Throne by a long shot. Rolling Spike back. Hey, this is a nice one to get a little bit of extra health. Uh, three costs, three, two with Aegis Reckless. Summon, create, and draw a random dinosaur. So a uh, couple of different bonuses on this one. One, it no longer trades with one ones and trades with things that like are going to be pretty easy to take care of it. Like it, for example, the one four is no longer a thing that the rolling spike back attacks into and immediately dies to. This thing can now like spar with a Minotaur Oathkeeper or Minotaur... Oh, the, the one five with war cry and endurance it can spar with a bunch of other like interesting units uh this has always been a fun way to get dinosaurs i've always liked this card because it's just like a good mix of value and risk uh, you are pl paying a decent amount for it but it's fairly hard to play on three uh you get a dinosaur you don't know if that dinosaur is going to be good you have aegis so you're basically versus against spell well versed against spells but the unit base is like if the, anything can actually block it then you lose advantage on that and then maybe the dinosaur card isn't as good this just has a lot of interesting ceilings and floors based on what the meta is at and what type of deck you're running and basically all the different tools that you want to be using so i think that this kind of just leads into some really interesting gameplay and giving it an extra point of health is uh it's something I approve of. I think that it's a much more interesting card as a result, and uh, I think it's something that can definitely see a little bit more play. Uh, it wasn't seeing a lot of play before. It certainly deserves to see a little bit of play because it's a fun dinosaur creator that also uh, has like a reasonable stat line and a good drawback, which is the reckless ability on it. Uh, Forge Mark Scrivener going to a 2-3 for 2 instead of a 2-3 for 3. Uh, getting the mastery on this is super easy. If you attack and you successfully don't die, then you immediately get a plus 1, plus 2 weapon, which allows you to build into, uh, well, you don't get it on your own Oni, but it allows you to build into the second mastery pretty easily. Um, as far as this being a thrown aggro tool, I'm very curious to see how that's going to play out. Uh, playing the weapon definitely means that you get to trigger some interesting weapon-based opportunities, and also you get to buff up some of the Oni that are a little bit more vulnerable. Plus one, plus two is an unusual weapon type, so this is something that, once again, is just strange enough, in the same way that rolling spike back is strange enough, as to promote some really interesting and fun gameplay. Um, it looks like something that, if I saw it in a draft, I would be absolutely terrified of it. This card was already like pretty decent in draft, and like seeing it in a draft environment now would be absolutely horrifying. In Throne, uh, it's a really interesting uh, tool, and I'm curious to see if Oni decks can actually make enough use of it to like outweigh other aggro options or play around with other like different choices. Um, it's nice to see the card, see strange cards getting some love. Forge Mark Scrivener is definitely a strange card, and this is a card that has like some really interesting gameplay complications. So I think I'm all in favor of this buff as far as things go. So yeah, uh, by and large, nothing too uh, serious. The Maveloft Huntress is by far the biggest change to Expedition. The Akaria buff is by far the biggest change to Throne, and the Power Cell buff is probably third most in terms of like overall impact. Although Lookout is, I think, the most dangerous of the lot in terms of like just generally oppressing the meta. Uh, I think that it's also like probably elf aggro doesn't have so many tools that it doesn't uh, benefit enough from this actually happening. Uh, look out for Expedition Sentinels. They're going to be pretty interesting. Uh, keep in mind that your blue decks are going to change up quite a bit as a result of this Maveloft change and Hopefully uh, that's uh, all you need to know about uh, the current setup. Uh, we do have one other thing to do. I never reviewed uh, the promo card for uh, Lord Stayer's Adjutant, I believe it's called. Uh, mostly because there wasn't really much to remark about it. I, I think we had we had it on the first day and we were planning on reviewing it and then we just kind of never got to it. And that's that's uh, that's about my opinion of the card, unfortunately. So Lord Balancer Stayer, four costs, three, three. Cards can't cost less than three. Uh, it's a three, three with an effect that basically makes other cards cost more, which uh, does mean that you can do some interesting things with it regarding like other types of like 
like search effects and things like that, and you can punish aggro a little bit with it. Um, overall, I'm just not a big fan of these types of effects. I think that the cost for the stat line makes it not uh, super reasonable as anything more than a market choice or a meta choice. If you want to do something really interesting with the card to like make cards that cost uh, a little cost a lot and then do something cool with that, then there are a couple of interesting card cost interaction cards that will play around with this a little bit, and it will punish cards that punish players that are like playing multiple cards per turn and slow down aggro decks if you can get to it very very quickly. Um, in both circumstances, though, I don't think this thing is making an intense splash in Expedition, and it's only a mildly interesting option in Throne. Uh, this was kind of a just not all that interesting for me, so we didn't end up reviewing it very much. Uh, but yeah, that's Lord Lord Balancer's Dyer. He uh, does a couple of different things, and uh, all of the things that he does are like just kind of average in power level and uh average in terms of like my general johnny interest i think that like uh, if you've got the uh if you want to like build like an interesting deck around cards that cost a lot this is definitely an option but like the stat line the cost the double influence cost uh which i mean is definitely necessary if you're going to be using a card that punishes players for playing cards that cost less than three um like that kind of like interaction just kind of needs to be solely in justice and like something along those lines. But yeah, there's not really many things here that sort of appeal in terms of like wanting to play this and getting a good result out of it. Uh, if you actually get the like ideal combo out where your cards all cost less than three, you still have lands balancing your deck out. There's probably not like an insane combo that's allowed as a result of that. So, um, but Regardless, uh, we do have some cool patch balances going up. I'm sure the next promo will be better than the last one. Uh, and like, by and large, I'm pretty excited about uh, Eternal uh, in the future. We're also playing a lot more MTG Arena at the moment. So if you want to tune into our streams, we stream Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday from 7 to yeah, about 10-ish PST. And of course, you can always find me on Patreon and here on YouTube, which uh, if you're not subscribed already, please do. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. Have a lovely evening. Cheers.